everyone. My name is uh, Stefan van Grieck. Um, I'm from France, and today I'm going to talk about uh, how to create beautiful website using PSHTML and Polaris. Um, so in this session, um, we're going to cover um, like the PSHTML fundamentals, which is a PowerShell module I'm going to explain everything about. Uh, we're going to uh, learn some basic web development skills, just enough for you guys to be able, in the end of this uh, presentation, to build beautiful website, of course. Um, we're going to create static HTML pages using so PSHTML. We're going to create dynamic HTML pages using PSHTML and Polaris. And we're going to create a web application fully with PowerShell using PSHTML and Polaris. So the agenda, I have um, um, cut this session in three uh, parts. First, I'm going to really have a slow introduction to PSHTML, which also is going to cover some um, web development stuff. Uh, we're going to learn so what PSHTML is, how to use it, and some basic and advanced functionality of the PSHTML module. Then in the second step, um, I will introduce you guys to a tool called Polaris, which is actually for the back end. And same thing, what it is, and some basic usage. And then we're going to see, we're going to combine it together at the very end of this demo, um, of, this, of this presentation, and to show you guys what you can potentially build with PSHTML and Polaris. So PSHTML, what is PSHTML? PSHTML is a cross-platform PowerShell module it actually reproduces the HTML uh, language structure. So in other words, it, it is a DSL, so domain-specific language. So for the people that don't know what a DSL is, if you have used Pester, you know what a DSL is, because Pester is a domain-specific language. And uh, it actually integrates very, very well with uh, PowerShell. So this slide here is more for reference. Uh, PSHTML is an open source project on uh, MIT license. Um, here I have just uh, the links to the GitHub page and also to the uh, read the docs getting started um, page, which is a documentation I wrote, which I think is pretty good to start with. But if you've attended this talk, you don't need to go to this link. Um, yeah, so to understand PSHTML, let's first start to understand what HTML uh, structure is, what an HTML document is here. So here on the left side, we have an HTML structure. We can see um, it's actually node. So we have an HTML node, a head, and in a head we have the title, and then in there we have some text. So simple example here it's written. Then we have a body. Uh, in the body we have H2, P, uh, some lorem ipsum, etc., etc. That's an HTML structure. On the right side here, we have the PSHTML structure, which if you compare it, it's actually the same thing. We have an HTML over here, the head here, title, body, um, H2, paragraph, et cetera, et cetera. As a matter of fact, the code that you see on the left side has been generated using the code on the right side, right? So it is pretty straightforward. So if you know how to develop if you're a web developer and you know how to write HTML structure, you can use this uh, PSHTML model without even uh, thinking more. So, um, okay, so in, this is my first demo. I have chosen to record all of my, uh, my demos and only screen videos because I've seen people fail pretty often. So I don't want to fail. So expect, it, I could still fail, but uh, voila, the risks are minimized over here. So um, I'm going to start very slowly with the basics of PSHTML and more of, of HTML and web development in general, so that people that are not aware of that, that they can you know, get into the train, and then we can go to this journey all together, and it's going to be fun. Um, so yeah, this is then the introduction. We can see, um, okay, PSHTML is a cross-platform PowerShell module. Um, it's available on the gallery. You simply do, yeah, it's working. You, can, you simply do install module PSHTML. And um, we have get command. We have quite a bunch of commands. And in total, we have 91 commands. Most of the commands are actually replications of HTML tags, so p, div, and et cetera, et cetera. And uh, there's a strong prerequisites on PowerShell 5. 
This is a more concrete example, just an HTML structure. We have HTML, those are all script blocks. We have a title, a link, a body, header, div, paragraph, etc., etc. So this is really not rocket science. I just output it in a, in a variable and I export that to a file and then F5 and then here we have the, the page. So we have the different titles, et cetera, et cetera. So I didn't know where to put this one, so I put it here. Um, there's one small um, thing. There's a, did it pause there? Yeah, so every HTML commandlet um, from the module comes with a default set of parameters. And I wanted to show you this uh, so you can afterwards build on top of that. So here I have the example of the P, so for paragraph, and every HTML tag has then content, class, ID, style, and attributes, which, where's my mouse? My mouse is here, attributes here. So title is specific to the parameter. So content actually asks for a script block, so basically you can add PowerShell code in that script block or other HTML elements, so div inside of that in P, and then spawn and etc. And then, um, yeah, style is for inline style, and ID is to reference the, the I, oh, I can show you the, the demo. So, <clears throat> so, content class ID style. And I'm just going to do a short example of, of each of those on for different paragraphs. So we have here a P element with the ID, then a P element with a class, uh, inline style, color blue, with a very big font size of 46 pixel, uh, and then some custom attributes. And I will come back to the custom attributes in a, in a, few, in a few slides, actually. So, and I just simply do uh, F5, and it goes into a file, and I open it. And we can see immediately we have the styling in blue, like the very big font size. This page is actually useless, it's not be beautiful, but we will get there. Uh, and uh, we can see we have the custom uh, ID, the custom class, inline style here, and the custom attributes. Okay, so as a recap, we have for every HTML tag, the, um, those elements, so content, ID, class, and style. So these are parameters that are available on every HTML tag in uh, PSHTML. And these are actually attributes that um, you have uh, in HTML. And there's this additional one called attributes um, to allow you to add um, parameters that are not available on any of the HTML commandlets. And I'll come back to, to that in a second. So we have the content ID class style on every one. And then a lot of uh, the HTML tags have some specific parameters, like the link tag has an href and a rel, which is very specific to, to this. And so here we can see an example, link, and we have the dash href and then dash rel, and for the script, dash src, which means that, you ca for example, you cannot find the href on a div, or you cannot find an href on a p, for example. Right? And so, because there's so many of them, I didn't implement them all. Right, there was way too much work. So this is why we have the attributes. It allows to pass you uh, an array of, well, not an array, a hash table, where you can give the, the attribute name and the attribute value. So in, in case you don't see um, that parameter that you're looking for, it's, you're not blocked, you have the attributes parameter that you can use. And then I would actually like uh, that you open an issue on a, on a piece of HTML repository. And voila. So if today you, you're searching for uh, a parameter, for example, I go here uh, on W3 schools, I want to create an input box uh, where I want to write some text and I want to validate that that text is actually an email address, right? So, and for that, I'm like, oh, okay, this should work with, an, uh, with, a, with a pattern, with a regex thing. So if I look at, at it here, we have. Uh, it exists an attribute called pattern for the input box. Okay, great. And here I have some demo code, and I'm just going to try. Uh, so that's the line that uh, we're going to execute. But here, if we do input and dash p for pattern, we can see the, the parameter is not present, right? 
So here you use the attributes just to pass in uh, the pattern and if you execute this code in a form, then <clears throat> we're gonna have this uh, text input box and basically we can write some text and it's gonna say, okay, this is not what we want. It doesn't respect the, the regex here in a French way of talking. And um, still not okay and then dot com and then okay. And so here it redirects us to other page.html, which is a page that doesn't exist, and it was part of the of the, the redirection. So if so, that's only for missing attributes, right? So this is maybe not useful now when you look at this talk now, but I think when you're gonna rewatch this video and you're gonna start developing, you, you're gonna see some stuff is missing, and this is how you can add it. And so. Um, Use attribute as a workaround, but please, if you use attribute as a workaround, open a, an issue on the PSHTML repository so, we, so that we uh, add it as a, as a, a definite parameter in the, in the thing. So another thing I want to talk about is tables. So um, in PSHTML, it's possible to create HTML tables in two different ways. The first way is to rep, uh, replicate the full uh, HTML um, uh, full structure using table, T head, T, uh, table rows, T bodies, etc. Or you can do it using a, a more dynamically, uh, more dynamic way, uh, using uh, a commandlet called convert to PSHTML table, which is going to do all that for you uh, magically. So um, I'm going to demonstrate here two ways of doing that. On the left side here, on, on the middle of the screen, we have um, again a, a paragraph, and I add a, I have a table caption and a table header with table row and some table headers in it. Then another row with table data in it, some custom class, and that's it. F5, output it in the file. Um, UTF-8, that's actually pretty important. And that's it, we have here an HTML table. And then here, same thing, but using the um, the convert to PSHTML table, here we can see that um, I'm getting the 10 first processes on my machine, and I put that in a variable, and then I assign that variable to the dash object, and then I select to show only name and handles. And then again, I output using encoding UTF-8, a name handles, and then we can see it's also possible to add some custom classes, uh, styles, everything on different parts of the HTML table. So on the body, on the header, on etc. So we have like a pretty big granularity. And here we have like, uh, so this 10 first processes. Not very useful, but it's for demo purposes so that you understand the, the basics. And we can see the table rows, um, the table head, etc., etc. So includes. In PSHTML, it's possible to use uh, something I called include, and it's simply to help you to encapsulate, encapsulate identical code blocks. Um, it's also good for code reuse and for to reduce the refactoring scope. So a good example of that is, for example, in the footer page or menu that you have on one page and you want to have it actually on several different web pages, right? And so. You, you write it in one specific file and you simply call it with an include and you can reuse same chunks of code, which is also great when you need to um, update it. So you don't have to go and update it in several places. So here we can see I have two files called uh, body and footer, body.ps1, footer.ps1. In body.ps1, I simply get the first three services and I convert it to a PSHTML table, which we just saw before. And in footer, I just have a paragraph with uh, some copyright uh, thing. Basic HTML structure, as always. Then we do write PSHTML um, include, and then dash name, and here we have a dynamic parameter, which is gonna find all the includes that you have in the, in the folder. And there's also an alias for write PSHTML include called include. And same thing, dynamic parameter. Um, so if you add includes in there, automatically going to be found by the, by the thing. And um, here we can see the three services that we stopped and uh, the little um, copyright section at the, at the very bottom. Um, 
So now it, we're going to start a little bit with the, with the fun stuff. Um, so we're using um, PowerShell now in, in, in PSHTML, because that's all about uh, what we want to talk, right? So it's possible, for example, to uh, integrate existing syntax elements of the PowerShell language into the PSHTML, because it's a DSL. So it's possible to, to add logic like for each's, do wows, and all that good stuff create functions, actually, as a matter of fact, convert to PSHTML table is just a function, a wrapper, around TR, T-head, and all that stuff. And I'm just doing some uh, for each and all, that, and all that other stuff. So here we see the example. I have, like, my favorite languages, PowerShell, Python, C Sharp, and Bash, which is not actually true. But, um, and then we have, like, an unordered list, and then I have a for each, and um, I just simply go for each uh, element in the languages array, and I print out a list item. And this second element here on the right, I'm use, you can actually use any PowerShell module. So here I'm importing the local accounts uh, module. I'm simply getting the local group administrators, um, and put in variable, and I'm getting all the members of the, of the, uh, the local group, and I convert to PSHTML table and output the name and the SID. And down here, select tag is actually for a drop-down box. So again, here, for each. So it's possible to use external modules, Active Directory module, your custom modules, and the elements of the PowerShell language. Everything that you know can actually work in here. So now for the demo. So this is actually what we kind of like saw before, but instead of languages, is fruit. Um, apple, banana, orange, ananases. And an uh, unordered list, and then for each element of that unordered list, we create a list item of that fruit. And so here we see we have my fruits, and then the yeah the unordered list item. Not super sexy, but uh, we will get there. Here, something more uh, interesting maybe. I import the Hyper-V module. I get the v all the VMs. I sort them by state on my machine. So I know I, I go a little bit quick here. Um, I organize them by state. Then I, and I convert it to PSHTML table, so I'm gonna list all the VMs on my machine, and then I have a second part where I am getting only the running machines, and I want to output uh, the switch name, the MAC address, and the IP address, and convert them to a PSHTML table um, of the machines that are running. So switch name, MAC address. And so here we have it. At the top, we have like the, the list of my local VMs, Two are running, and we can see DC001 and SQL001 both have uh, this IP uh, configuration. So um, again, this is just for demo purposes. It doesn't make any much sense here, but voila. Uh, working with assets. So I think about now you should have a kind of like an idea of what is possible to do with something like this. Uh -huh. And uh, when you add assets, it's going to make everything look shiny and, and super beautiful. So um, assets is something I, I call like this. Um, in the web development world, everything is done. So styling is done using CSS, and then the actions and everything is done using JavaScript. And so you have some very smart developers, web developers, or even companies that build their own uh, yeah, frameworks huh? and that help you to do uh, like styling very easily using only classes, for example, and then uh, uh, they have built like uh, amazing uh, JavaScript libraries called GS for everything that has to do with animation on a, on a web page and everything. And this is, of course, something that we don't really uh, manage to do uh, that well in, in the PowerShell world. But it's possible for us to integrate those um, those yeah I call them asset, but those frameworks. And so PSHTML comes with three assets, so three integrated frameworks, so basically when you do an install module uh, PSHTML, you also have Bootstrap, jQuery, and Chart.js. And um, I'm gonna show you right now uh, what uh, you actually can do with those frameworks. So we can see here in the assets folder, we have Bootstrap, Chart.js, and jQuery. You use a commandlet called write PSHTML asset, dash name, and then here we have two bootstrap, chart.js, and jQuery. So it's a dynamic parameter again, so if you add folders, you're gonna find it. We have two bootstraps simply because we have 
This bootstrap has two files, one CSS and one GS. And basically, uh, the dynamic parameter can, if you filter them by type, it's going to find only the, the good bootstrap. If you decide not to put any, um, any, yeah, any, um, any parameter, it's going to write all of the assets that are available in the assets folder. So here we can see the link for the CSS, the script source, uh, the, the three script files. So here, this is a, a case where, let's say, you have some business logic in a JS file. Um, I'm just creating one JS file here. I'm adding it. I'm re-importing the module, and I'm just executing the code, outputting it in a file, and uh, yeah, adding the right asset. And you can see um, we have the new psconf eu uh, JavaScript possibility. I output in a file. There's nothing to see here except that in the head we have uh, access to this script now. So if you have JavaScript um, automation in there, uh, you can actually use it, or that the developers can actually use it. So that's for assets. So now you, we know what our framework is. We know how we can add it in a, in a PSHML document. And so now let's try to use it, right? And so I mentioned Bootstrap, and it's actually called Twitter Bootstrap. So Bootstrap is just a bunch of CSS file and JavaScript functions that uh, are made available. And for everything that has to do with styling, it, it really simplifies everything. Bootstrap is really amazing on that part. If you add Bootstrap to your, any of your HTML documents, it automatically responds it, which means it's mobile friendly. It's going to scale on a tablet and everything. right? And it's actually very, very popular in the web dev community. So if you have questions or you know, there's a lot of examples, documentation is well written. It, it's not something that's very obscure. And it's super easy to use, but like really, really easy. And it's waiting to take a picture, okay? And so developing with PSHTML and Bootstrap, let's see that how that worked together and what we can build on top of that. So you can see here on um, the right side, I have a uh, Google Chrome open, and on the left side, I'm just importing uh, the HTML module, and at the end, as usual, I'm just outputting the, the file uh, using encoding UTF-8. Here I have some basic content, uh, a title, and some paragraphs here and there. And so here we see no bootstrap. It looks pretty uh, sad. And uh, yeah, the objective is to make that look a little bit pretty. So now I'm just changing the title to with bootstrap. I am adding the references in the head to the different um, so assets, huh? so actually the, the, the framework. So here, no parameters, so I'm writing them out. We can see already the font here has changed. It's simply because. Uh, we have a link to the bootstrap library, and automatically it does like a little bit of that styling for us. Now here, I'm simply going to add um, a wrap around this, this uh, a div around there. So div is just to kind of like make a small section of code. It's transparent for, uh, for the user using the website. And I'm just adding something called the Jumbotron. It's, so this is a CSS class. You just put a string in the class thing here, and we can see, boom, we have that gray little uh, area. So I don't really like when it's full width, so I actually here add dash class container, and we see, boom, it's smaller now. And actually, well, we don't see the end of the, of the web page, but it's also it's equalized in the center. And um, here, you, may, you might wonder, OK, where can I find actually all that information? Where, you know, what type of classes can I use? Simply Google uh, bootstrap documentation. You can see here on the left the components, things. You can look for it. And then you go look at an example. So here, I wanted to have that green message. It looks nice to make a kind of like a validation of something. We can see here on the right, the class here needs to be alert, alert dash success. Copy paste it, add it in it, F5, and here we have it with absolutely no effort. At least not an outside, like Twitter actually created that. So they, they invested like a lot of time in that. So um, that was nice. Um, and this is a, actually, technically, this was actually a very interesting part for me to write. So this is um, PSHML chart is based on a framework called chart.js. Um, so PSHML supports the creation of charts since version 7.1. So it has a dependency on chart.js library, which is one part of the assets. And uh, one important thing is that chart.js draws uh, charts on something called a canvas. It's actually an HTML tag like div. Um, so it means you need to put a canvas somewhere in your HTML document. So th here are the examples of the kind of charts you can, you can do. I support four 
uh, in PSHTML. We have the bar chart on the left, the pie chart on the right, the donut chart on the left, and here the line chart on the right. Um, so charts, um, they actually it, it, they exist more charts um, in the Chart.js library, but those four for me were the most common ones. So if you guys think, okay, I would like to have another type of chart, because you know the Chart.js library maybe, so just open an issue on the PSHTML repository and uh, we will be happy to look into that. So the, the PSHTML charts part, and it's actually uh, how the Chart.js library is written, it's not complicated, but there's a slight learning curve actually that you need to go through if you want to understand how you build a chart. And it's, it's just how it, how it is. It's very slight, and so I hope that in this slide you guys are gonna have some um, help with that. So first what you need to do, you need to have data. Uh, and it's basically an, an array of integers. So two, zero, one, four, two. That's maybe like the amount of tickets that are um, still open at the end of the day. For example, unresolved tickets. So two on Monday, uh, zero on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, etc. Then you need to have a data set. To that data set, you, ha you need to pass in that array um, of data, and you give it, can give it some options, so like a label and a color. So for example, um, all um, open tickets from week 42, and then the color, for example, the color of that line, you want it to be blue, right? or red, or whatever. And then uh, here in green, the chart, which you have to give one or more data sets, and I'll come back to that in a minute, and then some options as well, labels, and, and you can put some other stuff, but, and here one important thing is to point it to the canvas ID. Remember I said you need to have a canvas, and so you need to say where you want to have that chart that's going to be placed. And of course, because all of that is JavaScript, uh, it needs to be surrounded in a script block, but that's just one additional script block. And so, yeah, let's go in the demo of the charts. Here we can see this is a very uh, easy uh, to understand chart. Uh, this is a bar chart. Here we have the canvas I mentioned. Um, I have a reference here to the CDN version of the um, of the chart.js library because that's also possible. And here simply I have like my data, all these number represents <laughs> something. And then we have like the, the label, so January, February, March, April, etc. That third line there we can see we create the data set. The data set is specific to the type of chart that you want to create simply because the options differ according to the, the type of chart you want to create. You can give it some option like background and everything, and then you give that uh, data set to the PSHMO chart. You point it to the canvas ID, which is over here, and then I'm simply executing the code. And it went on the other screen, so time that I bring it back over here. And here we see like with really very f small set of effort, we have like a, a good looking bar chart, I think without bootstrap here. So here in this one, I'm going to present the four uh, different um, charts that you can create in PSHTML. Here we can see I have four canvas, one for the bar, one for the pie, one for the line, and one for the, for the donut. And then here we can see we have the data. The data is the same that I'm using all on the other, on all the, the charts. And we can see we have March, April, and May for it means we have three data sets, and I am simply creating a chart of type bar and passing one, two, three data set, pointing to a specific canvas. And basically I do this uh, four times using four different types of charts. So all of this is very well documented on that link I sent, uh, I said at the very beginning. And um, so there are more examples there. And so I wanted to show is that Right here, we see here, this is one chart and three bars. And actually, each of this bar is a data set. So we, ha we had one color, remember, and one label for a data set, which was March, another one was April, one of May. So this is actually, and you can put hundreds of them if you want, and this is actually very good to compare 
the same data over amount of time, right? And so this actually works only for bar and for lines, for example, but oh, bar and lines, but not for um, but not for donuts and for it's a bit confusing because to go on that screen, I have to go that way actually. And so yeah, you see the line here, it's the same data, three different data sets on one chart. And then here we can see we have this time a link to a local script, to the local chart GS, which means that to create those graphs, you're not dependent on the internet. And um, yeah, I wanted to know, who, who knows a report unit? That actually, okay, a few hands. So that tool is pretty cool. For those who don't know what it is, it's a tool to generate like beautiful graphs of um, pester reports. And um, it has like a, yeah, beautiful graphs and everything, but it's, so it's an XFL and it's hard coded with a CDN. Um, so it points to the internet. I work in a server field, so I don't have access to the internet on my servers. So it was beautiful on my, on my workstation and then when I brought it into uh, on, on a test server, then I saw, okay, I don't have the, uh, the internet there. And so the report was really uh, useless, so uh, we decided not to use it. Here, this actually makes, uh, gives us new opportunities. So combining everything together. So here, this is um, a demo here. It's a tribute to Snover, who is a guy who actually does a little bit of PowerShell. And um, basically, I'm grabbing here an image of his uh, Twitter profile. I am uh, going on his Wikipedia, because Mr. Snover has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> And I'm doing an invoke web request, just grabbing all the paragraphs that's on, in there, doing some link sanitation. Um, and then I go also on this, this other thing that I found on the internet called Snoverism. And I, where's my mouse? Yeah, called Snoverism. It's actually, Snoverism is a, is a website, if you don't know what it is, a website created by Don Jones, uh, where he listed all the funny sentences that Mr. Snover can say, and they're actually pretty funny. You guys will see, and you see, what I'm doing here, I'm just doing a few invoke web requests, I'm just parsing a little bit the text because it's, it's a little bit rough when I, when I receive it, and then I simply hear, for the Snoverism, I output it as, a, as a, an unordered list with a few list items. And yeah, at the bottom here, I have my write PSHTML assets, and here I have a generated with love, uh, using PSHTML, and then I simply F5, and so I have bootstrap integration here, and, um, and here we have it, and see, it's like in a, in a little bit, not much work, we have like uh, all the bio of uh, Jeffrey Snover and his Snoverisms, and <laughs> this one I actually really like, it is the when in trouble, fear or doubt, run in circle, scream and shout. Does that make sense? No? I don't know. It was just funny. I, just, uh, I wasn't expecting him to be in my talk, so I'm really honored. Well, uh, okay. Uh, yeah. So um, that's for that. And then, so this may be a more concrete example here. Um, so I manage a, a user group, the French PowerShell user group, uh, which we have a PowerShell Saturday in September, by the way in Paris. Um, so before starting this recording, I have authenticated with the uh, meetup.ps, meet but I'm just not showing my secret keys here. I am so using a module to, to get the information. I have some links here, which I put in a variable, see an A, so an A, that I put in this variable, and then this variable is used over here, then I use over, again in this variable. So it's possible to reuse the code like that. And I have like the famous uh, Jumbotron again from Bootstrap. I added into a container and um, some meetup information. Here I have a canvas, so expect to see a, a chart. And um, here we have uh, yeah, the bar chart that I'm creating. And at the very bottom, I export that to a PSHTML table uh, where I only want the properties local date. So yes, RSVP count. So that's basically the amount of people that says, yes, I will come. So don't, don't consider that as the amount of people that actually arrived, <laughs> because the, those numbers are not identical. And then the name of the talk. And here I use the, the module get meetup event. 
Um, yeah. Get the information and point it to the, the chart ID, to the canvas ID, sorry. And simply I do F5. And it's going to take a second, and here we have it. We have, so this is our bar chart, and we can see the number of sessions we had up until now. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so the, and this, okay. I want to show the numbers of the, of the French PowerShell user group. Here we can see them. Um, we have around 40 people. Okay, it doesn't want to show. And then like, uh, just to say that it's possible to reuse the same code, but using just another uh, user group. So I'm taking the example of the user group from Hanover. I'm gonna see how often they, they meet, right? And so they meet, uh, yeah, every now and then, and they had like really big rush uh, in September 2018, which was a PowerShell Saturday, and uh, yeah, they have around an average of, of 10 people. Um, so I imagine that this, this user group is um, on-premise, right? Yeah, because our meet user group is online, and so it allows people to connect from, from a bit everywhere, that, that's why. And, uh, and yeah. And so, for the guys who new report unit, uh, this is an extra thing. So this is a, kind of like a sneak peek on a module I'm still developing. It's not yet published, um, where I'm simply going to try to reproduce that report unit functionality um, that actually did, that I could not use. And so one of the drawbacks as well is that one, you need the internet in connection, and two, that thing was not cross-platform, right? And this is. So it works on Linux. So here I have some um, test results in JSON of Pester. I have some custom CSS. And I add the Jumbotron that we know but pretty well now. I have a, so a table here. I don't use the convert to paste HTML table. I actually do, right there. <laughs> and um, we can see, yeah, I say all these properties I want to have, total count, pass count, all that stuff. And um, I have one canvas over here, and I should have another one a bit lower. So expect to see um, at least one graph, and actually there are two graphs. So for the ones that know report unit, so this is n not super close to, man, sorry about that. This is pretty close to what report unit looks. So I still have some, some styling issues here, but I'm getting there. Like sooner or later, it will look pretty and how I want to have it. And what is cool with this is this is cross-platform. It works on, on Linux, on Mac, on, on Windows, of course. And um, you don't need to have a CDN, so internet access, right? And those were the two drawbacks of report unit, dot .exe, and voila, it's there. So, uh, yeah, snippets, just one part. I don't know where to put this slide. Uh, I put it here. Um, PSHTML also comes with a commandlet called install PSHTML VS Code snippet for the ones that are a little bit lazy. I, um, it's going to install the snippets in uh, the specific folder of the snippets, and then you can do PSHTML, uh, and then you can see there's a bunch of snippets, and here you can see uh, it helps you to do some baller code um, with uh, with the HTML code, which can be a bit challenging if you're not very familiar with the HTML structures and everything. And so we only have a few, but I'm counting to build like really lots and lots of them. But then uh, we'll have two kids and everything, so it's, uh, it's time consuming. <laughs> voilà. um, okay, so now we arrive to the interesting part. So up until now, we have done this uh, slight uh, learning curve of HTML, and we've cre created only static and local pages, right? And so now Polaris um, is going to help us to um, improve that and make things more dynamic. So what is Polaris? Polaris is a cross-platform minimalistic web framework for PowerShell. It is an open source project uh, by MIT, and it has been um, written by Tyler Leonard and Mika Rerdan. So I think Tyler is maybe not in the room, but at least here. Um, so if people have questions about Polaris, please go to uh, Tyler. And, um, but I think he's very nice, actually. And so uh, the link to the Polaris uh, GitHub um, page. 
And so let's have a, the demo here. So how does it work? It's uh, on the PowerShell gallery. So the, I need to click, click play. It's in the PowerShell gallery install module. And um, you import the module Polaris, and then you create something called a root. And then you start Polaris. So here, it's going to create a web server in the background. And then you just go and point to that web server. So here is localhost. It's localhost slash hello world. And we can see here we have hello world. And so this, this was what? Four lines of code. It's really easy. The next step here, I'm creating a slightly more complex example where uh, slash processes, and basically I want to return the first three processes of my machine and convert that to HTML. So using the PowerShell convert to HTML, not the, voila. And so we have a HTML table of the first three, five processes. So, voila, not really rocket science, but voila. It's not limited to only HTTP requests, so if uh, you're comfortable with PowerShell, you can open your, your shell, do an invoke rest method, point to that URI slash hello world here, what I'm doing, and you get the hello world back. So it acts as a rest endpoint as well, which is pretty cool. So this shows a little bit like the possibilities, right? And I just want to recap here how Polaris works because it's maybe not that very uh, straightforward if it's the first time you hear about it. So one, first you create a root, so slash hello world slash whatever, using the dash method. So you can create, uh, yeah, you can create get, post, delete, put, and some other ones. Yeah? And in my examples, I've used uh, the get. Then uh, you set the content type that you want to return it. Um, so, several ones are available. The most common ones are the ones I've used up until now is text plain, text JSON, text HTML. It's simply for the web browser or anything that's going to read the, the return value to, he, he knows how he's going to process the, the stuff. Then optionally, you can publish static files. Um, for example, if you want to have access to Bootstrap or other type of libraries, you use a public static root, but I will show all of this in a, in a demo. And then you start the, the, the Polaris server, and that's it. You're done. A very basic example here, I import the Polaris module, and I have two roots here, um, two get roots. You can see new Polaris get root. Um, and then we have uh, the path is like psconf test. And um, I couldn't, it's a, I set the content, so dollar response is what you have, it's a variable that you automatically have in the, in the script blocks. You set the content type to text HTML. Um, I send here back uh, P, so that's, the P element is from PSHTML. I create a paragraph here and I simply say hello conf, PSConf. And then I send the, that variable HTML back. And that's it. That's pretty easy, right? Same here for whoop, uh, just another, it was just another uh, root here, so it's possible to go slash whoop, and then you're gonna get who back, right? And then you start the server. So this is the basic of what you need to do for Polaris uh, web server uh, endpoint. And so those two roots here are now in, let's say, that, that same server file here, but I would recommend not to do it like that because it can be pretty messy or, the code of a root can be pretty big, and so if you have a lot of roots, you're gonna have a lot of code in there, so I think it's good to separate it, and so um, in the example I'm gonna show, I have separated that in, in files, and I'm just dot sourcing them, so just you're aware of it. And so now we're gonna combine everything um, all together, PSHTML and Polaris. So, um, yeah, I have one minute left, so that's actually perfect. Um, hmm? Ah, okay, so. Okay, <laughs> that's good then. Um, yeah, so here uh, in this, ex so I'm gonna have two videos here. The first one I'm gonna show you kind of like an application I've built. It's, it's nothing big, but super small, but just for, so that you understand the power of those two things combined together. And then I'm gonna show in a second video how the code is built, how I've built that. And of course this code is going to be able on, uh, available on, on GitHub in uh, the PSConf part. So I launched the app, it, it was on my other window.
And then we see here, so you, re you recognize the Jumbotron from Bootstrap. I have here, PSHMO loves Polaris, of course. And then we have like, a, so I do a list of all the local admins in my, on my computer. Uh, we can see I have uh, four or five users here. Um, I simply do a convert to page HTML, PSHTML table here. And at the very bottom, I have um, two parts, add user and remove user. I've here then the possibility to create a user. I give it, so PSConf user, I give it a description and um, a password. And then I simply validate. So then I have a validation message and then saying that it's going to redirect in three seconds and then I come back. And you see that now in the admin group, I have this additional local user, right? And if you look in the list, automatically it got refreshed. We have that new PSConf user. And also in the drop down box there below, this PSConf user is there. So now we click remove, it's gonna remove it. And it's gonna say, okay, has been removed, redirecting in three seconds, and then come back. The piece confuse is not there anymore, and it's not in the list, and it's not in the administrators group, right? And this is 100% PowerShell, right? There's no, there's no magic, everybody understands this, right? And so there's also some error handling in the background here. So for example, I have a user called Whoop, the user actually already exists. That's a, um, a dummy user I have on my, on my machine, and you can see it's over here. And see, it didn't add it to the list, and so it, it does also some try and catch here in the background. So that's the, a basic application of uh, piece HTML with Polaris together. So how does this work? Um, how is this built? We have this folder structure, and so uh, I have a server.ps1 which you can see here, uh, where we have like the start Polaris and all of that, and then I have my styles in those folders, so bootstrap and everything. So basically you can point it, see, I'm creating a new static root here to that styles thing, but actually you can point it to the assets folder of the piece HTML module, and it will work the same, same way. In roots here, I have individual files for every root, one for add user, one for index, index is actually that, that main page, and um, and one for remove user, and so let's have a look at all of these uh, roots, for each of these roots. So here we have the add user. The first thing I do, so dollar response an automatic variable in Polaris, and you use that to do everything that has to do with the response you want to send back. So first thing you need to do is set the content type. I want to set it here to an HTML document, and um, I do some here URL decoding magic, um, simply because I am um, getting, so that's the request, that's what I get from the form, and I will come back to that in a minute, um, because those buttons were actually form elements of an HTML um, document, and I simply parse it here, and I convert to uh, from JSON, and I have an object with, uh, which I can work with, so then I simply go and create uh, yeah, a password and new local user, and then give it like the, this is just simple PowerShell that you would do in a regular PowerShell script. Getting the local group, adding the, the member, and then I create a message here. See, I have a try catch. So if, okay, I have, see the, the classes of bootstrap, so alert, alert success. So that was the green message we had before. And if it failed, it would go into this catch method. So here we have also the message and to alert danger. And uh, then at the end here, I have the, an HTML variable where I have a very small, tiny part of a HTML document with some uh, bootstrap links, and here just, just a div with the message and the redirecting in three seconds. And that's it. And so actually the remove part is, um, okay. The remove part is, works actually the same thing. And see, dollar response dot send, HTML, and that's it. And so remove is exactly the same story. I set the content type to uh, text HTML, your own code, and then I get the group based on of our admins here. Um, get uh, the local user by Sid, and then I remove the user. And then again, at the end, I simply send the HTML document back, and that's it. And it's Polaris who's gonna handle it, or the, the, the web browser. And then we have the index page, so that's the, the main, so we saw the two routes, and now we can see the, the main page. The index page is where we landed at first, 
And on there, and we're going to see we have two form elements. <clears throat> so yeah, first we have the links to the to our different assets. <clears throat> so the different styles. So the styles that have been published using the new uh, static uh, Polaris file, I think. And then uh, I have my convert to page HTML table with the list of uh, local users. And uh, here we have a form for add user, and so this is actually where the magic happens. And this is actually what, what PHP also does, but it does it, uh, um, yeah, not PHP HTML. And we, uh, we can see uh, we have the, so the form, the action here is slash remove user, so basically when you click submit, the submit button is gonna redirect you to um, your uh, server name slash local user, or whatever you put here in this action here. And so, here it was to the slash remove user that was actually a Polaris root. Polaris root did the remove user stuff and then it went uh, further. And so here we have the remove user. The select tag is for uh, the drop down box. Um, select tag, why do we add added the, the tag? Simply because select is a, is a keyword in PowerShell. It's an alias for select object. So if there's a conflict with a, with a PowerShell keyword, we add the word tag uh, behind it. And yeah, what's also important is like the ink type here, application XWW form, uh, voila. And so, but you don't need to know this. You can do tab and you know, there's like a validate set. Here. It's a, I'm helping you there with the, with the module. And, um, and yeah, basically that's it. That's, um, that was like the big application and um, some, some examples in the field actually of PSHTML. Um, so I asked on, on, on Twitter, okay, if some people actually implemented PSHTML in, in production because uh, I didn't do it before, and I was actually surprised about the answers. And there was one person, Keyboard Crunch, which I don't know who that is. If he's here in this conference, I would like to meet him. He has, so he sent me a picture of this screen. So this is a 69-inch screen in his office that they have um, there and they use PSHTML to have a report on their uh, Windows updates compliance. So he uses a uh, PSHTML in combination with um, with the config manager commandlets to to get the, the compliance of their uh, updates. And voila, it's there. So that was pretty interesting. Um, Ravi Kanta also told me he was demonstrating uh, his work, what he created with PSHTML. Uh, at PSConf EU, and I think it's tomorrow morning, um, I think at 8.30, I'm not sure, but uh, go check Javi Khan's session, he's a he's pretty interesting uh, speaker. We, uh, so Chen, Chen Dryan, um, so this guy is really amazing because he helped me so much in, in just trying things out, and he comes up with, with ideas and with everything, and so for example, I showed today this with Polaris, right? The backend is Polaris, but we don't actually have to use Polaris. It's also possible, for example, to use Node.js or Go, right? And so this makes, because it makes everything very versatile, and yeah, this is simply fantastic. So Chen has uh, created like a requester information form using Azure Functions and everything, and, uh, and Node.js, which is pretty interesting also, I think. The links are in the very end of this, this session. Uh, he also has a talk about Polaris and PSHTML in uh, PSConf Asia, uh, the 20th of September, in case you're interested. And uh, this one was pretty uh, interesting. It's, uh, it's actually a colleague of mine from work. Uh, he came to me and was like, look what I've built. <laughs> and I was like, oh, but wait, I know that. So I masked here some, uh, some of the server names, some of the information, and actually he created a, um, a tool to create SQL reports on the compliance of uh, um, yeah, is everything okay or not? And so first uh, level support and second level support can use that as a, an information tool. And I thought it was surprising that my coworker used it without me even knowing it. And uh, yeah, it was pretty funny. So yeah, uh, I arrived to the end of this uh, demo, 54 minutes. Um, so basically, uh, you've learned what uh, the basics of PSHTML, you've learned the basics of Polaris, um, you, we've used assets, so external frameworks. We've seen it's possible to add other frameworks, so Bootstrap is not the only framework there in the world. There's a lot of other ones that you can use. Um, we've created charts. We have used existing modules um, inside of 
HTML code actually, uh, and we've created uh, static pages at the very beginning, simple ones, dynamic one, and in the end we have a web application. Um, here are the links, um, just for reference to uh, the different ones. So yeah, go check the, the Chen's uh, blog. He really has a lot of things about PSHTML and sometimes I ping him on Facebook and say, hey, how did you do that? <laughs> and he just sends me like the information. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And, uh, and yeah, voila, this is uh, the end of uh, my talk. So are there any questions? Okay, thank you. Are there, are there any, do we have time for questions? Yeah. Are there any questions? We have five minutes. Okay, we have five minutes for questions? Yeah, I see. Okay, uh, did you try to uh, implement some uh, request clients uh, with the uh, REST endpoints? Because if I'm uh, Coming from PowerShell and invoking REST methods, you gave me a JSON back, and if I came from a browser, I, you gave me the HTML back. Yeah, so you can, uh, well, you, you can set the content type of what you want to have yes, back, right? Yes, but on the same REST endpoint. I, I think know. that is possible. So for that, I would forward you to Tyler, right? Okay. Uh, maybe I can, uh, I can make you guys meet. Um, I have not done it personally. Um, but I imagine it's possible maybe uh, by just uh, doing a simple if-else statement uh, according to what you, how, you, how it has been called, actually. I imagine that in the dollar response or in the dollar context, which are two automatic variables in Polaris that you have access to in the root, uh, if we look into that, I'm pretty sure we, the, we can find some possibilities to filter on that, but I don't know for sure. Tyler can answer that question. I'm, I'm definitely will. Thank you. Yeah. Some other questions? Yeah. Um, is it possible to, to update content uh, dynamically on the website? Like um, update uh, an object every five seconds, so um, every five seconds uh, a script is run in the background? Yeah, it's actually possible. So, but it's kind of like a hack. Um, so normally this is done using JavaScript. So if you know how to do JavaScript, you can simply write JavaScript, put it in an asset, in a JavaScript file, put it in an asset and call JavaScript there. But it's also possible um, without reloading. What? No, so it's like the, um, you can use a, something called a meta tag where you can say uh, kind of like automatic refresh and you give it like a, a number of minutes. And this is what I did with the redirection in three seconds, right? And so, I don't know, yeah, I don't, I will show you maybe uh, offline, but it, it's possible to, to do a refresh, and so you can say, I want to refresh this page every 30 seconds, and it's, it's gonna act just like if you, had, um, if you had like a task schedule that's going to start every 30 seconds. Does that answer your question? Or is it, yeah, okay. Are there other questions? No? Okay, ah, yeah. Well, I think you need to wait for the running daily. <clears throat> uh, sorry, you had the, um, you're running the interactively when you're sort of testing the code. How do you run it as a service when you're wanting to just run it? So as a service, I don't know, because PSHTML is just the front end, right? I'm just rendering the language. And in the end, the language, HTML, is just text, right? And, the, and so what you have in the background, so that's, Polaris or Node.js, right? And so then we have to look into Polaris, right? And so I think Polaris can be run as a service, but I'm not super sure. I know Node.js is super possible, and really Node.js is not more complicated than what we saw over here. We all know how to write PowerShell, so if we know how to write PowerShell, we can at least read JavaScript code. Node.js is JavaScript code, so it's really not that difficult to implement that. And I would really recommend that you guys go through uh, this website from Chen and read this link about uh, Node, GS, and PSHTML because it, it's very simple. Okay. Sorry. What? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so Chen did it. Like Chen is a. So the question was if if this app, for example, can be hosted. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So Chen, for example, hosted uh, on Azure Functions, and on Azure, right? And so all all of the stuff that Chen does is. So I'm developing just the the PCHM module, and he really actually really uses it um, on on Azure. And um, yeah, he uses it in Azure uh, with Azure Function. I think he also has a thing with Node.js. So yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah, it's can completely it, can possible. Access normally from any uh, like any other website, normal website, to be accessed outside. The Sorry, I, I didn't, I didn't. It can be accessed accessed normally. Like any other website, normally. Yeah, but then, then, then it's a regular um, web stuff, right? So, if you want to query a specific URL, you know, it's actually in the end just an, AP, an uh, IP address, right? So you yeah, need to have a sure. DNS and everything, right? So that root. So here are my examples. I have localhost slash uh, remove user, for example. But localhost is just because the web server has been created on localhost. But I can just put it on on the web server, and then I create a DNS entry. And I point it to that thing, and then I just communicate that URL, and then everybody can potentially use it, yeah. right? Perfect. That's super easy, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. OK. Other questions? Oh, OK. At this point, I thought you were going to do another question. OK. Yeah. OK. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a wrap. OK. Thank you.